Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series, Literacy is Opportunity. My name is Laura Almazara, and I'm in the literacy team here at Amplify. Today's webinar is going to be recorded, and we're going to email out the recording link for you to rewatch as you'd like. Everyone joining us here today will also receive a certificate of attendance via email. And we have joining us a live captioner. So if you want to access the captions, click on live transcript at the bottom of the tray. Throughout the webinar, we welcome questions in the Q&A uh, section and also comments in the chat. So to get started, let's find out where everyone is joining us from today. You have some Midwesterners. Oh, there's an Arizona. And I'm in Tempe, Arizona, so I always love seeing some of those. Oh, we have someone from the Dominican Republic. Wonderful, welcome. Excellent. Uh, I want to let you all know a few bits of housekeeping, and then I'll introduce our wonderful guests. Um, we have lots more webinars scheduled in this series. Just This is just the second one we are presenting. So if you haven't signed up for more, please do. Um, we have some upcoming ones in a couple of weeks. We're, we're going to be hosting some customers who are talking about their experience using our elementary ELA curriculum, which is called Core Knowledge Language Arts. Uh, at the end of the month, we're hosting the wonderful Mitchell Brookins, who's going to walk us through why literacy is opportunity. And at the very end of the month, we have a webinar about uh, how the best intervention is prevention. And you can find out about all of those and more at our website, which is amplify.com slash literacy dash is dash opportunity dash series. And today we are talking about the five most critical shifts to make from balanced literacy. We're so excited to have Amplify's own Laura Seal, who is the executive director of Customer Insights. And joining us from Wisconsin, we have Laura Eicher, Martina Stelter, and Michelle Arnett. This incredible group is going to share insights from their shift to the science of reading. Michelle is a second grade teacher, Martina is a third grade teacher, and Laura is a principal. But before we get started, we have some poll questions. We're going to have two pop up in just a second. We'd love to know how familiar you are with structured literacy and the science of reading, and also what you're interested in hearing about today. And we will do our best to deliver on, uh, on your requests for that second question. So go ahead and answer those questions in the poll and we'll, we'll do what we can. So it looks like we have a good mix of people who are familiar and not so familiar with, the, with structured literacy and the science of reading, which is great. And same, we're, we're, we've got lots of people who are looking to make some of those practical changes in the classroom. Some people are looking for broader shifts away from balanced literacy at the school or district level, and also some people who just want to know how to get started. It's great. We'll, we'll wait another beat or two to let more people. Oh, there we go. The poll ended. So yeah, we have a really nice mix. So we're hopefully going to be able to deliver everything and then some to all of you. Um, for now, let me pass the mic over to my wonderful colleague, Laura, and so excited to hear what you all have to say. Thank you so much, friend, and thank you, um, panelists, for, for joining us. I had the privilege of meeting with each of you um, ahead of time and, and got to hear some of your stories, and so um, I'm really excited to, to bring it to this larger audience. Um, so I thought I would start with just asking each of you to kind of speak at a high level about your experience in, in making the shift to structured literacy science of reading, um, and then we can dive in a little bit deeper from there. Um, Michelle, you're the first person I met with with ahead of time. So would you mind going first and sharing what this experience has been like for you? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I teach second grade and um, we've been teaching uh, CKLA for, I've been teaching it for five years, same uh, second grade, all five years. Um, we, we had a program before this that um, taught our kids how to read, but there were a lot of gaps and holes and we were spending a lot of time filling those. So I think the conversation really started with um, I think what we're doing is okay. Is there something out there that's better for our students and um, better structured for us? And um, I'm very happy. I was not on the selection committee, but I've been um, thrilled with um, being able to teach CKLA and um, the progress that my students have made and, and what a, a great shift it's been, I think, not only for our grade level, but really just uh, for our whole building and our um, district wide. I think it's been really positive for us. Awesome. What I'm curious, what were some of like the moments that really led you to realize like we need to do something different? 
Um, well, for me, um, in um, first and second grade, because I was able to teach both in our previous um, curriculum, we were doing small groups, which was great. I was teaching for an hour and a half. However, the students I were working with was only with me for a half hour. So my my schedule said reading block was an hour and a half, but the kids were really truly only getting a half an hour. And then I was trying to come up with things that they could do independently while I was working with my other groups. Um, and I, Laura happens to be my principal and I can't say enough nice things about her, but we were trying to find kids, we were ability grouping and it just wasn't, it started not feel right. And we were finding gaps and holes that I think unknowing to us, we were sort of creating too, and um, looking for a universal curriculum that all of our students could um, do um, on a grade level was really important for us. And I think um, it was just time. Our previous curriculum helped us get a, in a universal curriculum and be on the same page. And then um, we needed something better. Awesome, thank you. Um, Laura, I'd love to turn it over to you. And from the com, uh, kind of principal administrative side, like what was that shift like for you? What were the um, key moments where you're like, we need to do something different? And what was that experience like? Sure, and I think um, going along with exactly what Michelle just said, um, we were in that place where we were spending a lot of time on paper um, in teaching reading skills, but in reality, it was a very small amount of time. And because those um, students were ability grouped, um, the gaps were widening, right? So, so um, those kids that were high level readers were continuing to be accelerated. And those kids that were um, struggling, we weren't really filling the holes like we, um, we needed to. And so um, and there was some attachment by teachers to that curriculum. So starting to have conversations with um, how are we going to close the gap? Um, how do we spend 90 or 120 minutes, not just on paper teaching reading, but truly teaching kids to read? As a teacher, can you justify spending only 30 minutes with a group and 60 minutes in, um, in, on independent work? Kids can't teach themselves. What's really important that we are providing that really explicit instruction. And so that was kind of the start of the conversations about why we needed to do something beyond balanced literacy. And I will be honest with you, our curriculum it wasn't a balanced literacy, but in that vein, it was that same sort of thought. Um, and so that was sort of the shift that started to happen. It started with conversations and just asking very pointed questions. Um, and as a teacher, you start to say, gosh, you know, I'm not, that's not okay. It's not okay that I have um, Johnny over here who's struggling to learn to read and I'm only seeing him for 30 minutes a day. So those are the conversations. Yeah, that's so that's so insightful. And I'm I'm curious, like you, you've spoken a little bit about um, you know, feeling really attached to the way you've been doing things. And like there's emotion, there's an emotional aspect of realizing that like you could be doing things better and and differently. And that's scary. So, you know, can you can you speak to like what that was like, especially in your role of, of having to support change like change and and like human emotions mm -hmm. um you know and i think people you're right there's there's an emotion attached to all of this right um especially if you've been very um critical in, in implementing what you're now using T people become very attached personally attached to things um but I think as we started to have conversations and making it more about students, not, not the curriculum, right? Let's talk about our kids. What do our kids need? What do they deserve? Um, and that started to allow us to have some conversations that were not so personal about you have to give up your curriculum or you have to give up something you, you want to do. It was more about what's best for our kids. We really need to think about those things. Um, and so I think that was the start of the conversation. Then talking about what does explicit instruction look like? And, and um, I remember having a conversation at one point where we couldn't agree as a K-3 on what were the most important words kids need, like the sight words. And then, so there's this conversation, like we we need some balance about, or and some there needs to be this continuity, this vertical alignment, and it wasn't there. And so that also helped drive that conversation. Sometimes you have to have a little bit step away, let people reflect, come back again, have more conversations, step away, reflect. It takes some time, um, but to do it right, it was time well spent. Right. And, and I would, I'm sorry, I would also piggyback off of that, that we spend a lot of time talking about not what you like 
about something, but being data driven on something that's actually going to work. And um, I think we were very fortunate to have a superintendent that was um, very pro ed report and actually looking at the research and how is a certain curriculum actually functioning and how is it producing for kids instead of just saying, oh, these teachers like this one or they don't like that one, but actually looking at the data and how is it working. I thought that was a really great step for us when we taught curriculum. That's awesome. Thanks for jumping in. Um, I, I have a bunch of follow-up questions, but I want to I want to get Martina in the mix. Do you mind giving kind of an overview of your experience? I'm curious how it how it's similar to and different from what these ladies have shared. Yep. So very similarly um, to what Michelle and Laura said, this is our fourth year of implementing CKLA in our building. Prior to that, we had a different curriculum that was quote unquote structured, um, but it was very teacher led. And so it was less independent work, less inquiry based, more teacher provides the content and the kids don't have the opportunity to really practice the skills. And I know I mentioned this when we had our one-on-one -on -one call that the biggest thing that really drove us to move away from what we had to what we have now with Amplify is the sheer fact that teachers were really overwhelmed and really stressed with the fact that they had to also play the role of being a curriculum writer um, and really understanding what those standards were asking for because my interpretation of the standard was not the same as someone even in the same grade level as me. And so that really drove wedges between people and really started to make those gaps even wider because people had different expectations. So what's been really refreshing with having CKLA is there is no guesswork in it. It's right there. You know, as Michelle said, the ed reports show that it is like evidence-based and there is content that really works and it's really structured and the rigor is there. So we don't have to try to create it. Um, we just have to follow it. And granted, there are things that we see throughout the years that have been proven, you know, that need to be modified, whether it's for that particular group of kids or for just uh, as a whole, it just does not work the way that Amplify maybe intended it to be. Um, one of the things is time allotments. You know, it says it's going to take 10, 15 minutes and we're like, well, we're going to take 20 to 25 and that's okay. But you learn that as the years go on and those are minimal changes that you can make that are not overwhelming um, because the, the content and everything has already been done for you. Right. And do you mind sharing, um, you know, there, there's, there's anxiety about trying something new and like, how did your, did you and your colleagues try a new program and how do you approach it year one versus year two and things like that? Yep. So year one was, was very much cut and dry. We're doing what is in the book. Um, we did not steer away because we had no, no ability to really do that. We didn't have any, you know, prior knowledge. There was a school district not too far from us, about half an hour um, away that was in year two of implementation. And so we were able to have calls with them and meet with them and say, Hey, how is, how is this working? Or how did this work for you? You know, last year to this year, what would you recommend? Um, so we had that. The first year was really follow it exactly how it is and take notes. And that was really the biggest thing is our teacher guides. If you open one of our teacher guides, there are post-its, there are pencil marks all over it. You know, so we took a lot of notes because we wanted to own what we had and really interact with it. Otherwise, it wasn't going to work. Um, that second year, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, that's when we really sat down as a team and decided, okay, so we've already done this. We know now kind of the gist of the unit. What, what are we doing? Um, there was one particular unit, especially in third grade, which is the grade that I teach, that it was all about ancient Rome. And there were a couple of lessons that just kind of continued and continued. And we just said, you know what, let's kind of break it down a little bit and maybe not do all of them because we could tell that last year, the kids were just really struggling with staying focused and attentive during those lessons. They were tired of learning about ancient Rome, you know, for 17, 18 lessons. Um, so we made those conscious decisions with our specialist for reading and sat down. And it wasn't a decision that we made as a grade level without administration because we wanted everyone on board. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's it's super helpful to get some of those tips like right in your teacher guide um, and and also be, you know, um, an active observer of how things are happening and, and then where do you fit in and how do you, you know, change the curriculum to su support your needs while while sticking to the the instructional guidance and systematic approach. So I think that's really helpful advice. Um, Michelle, you you are a veteran of of science of reading and CKLA. What like it, does this resonate with you about like what you've done in year one versus year two, and now you're in, I think you're in year five. Like how can you can you speak to how your relationship with the curriculum has changed over the years? Absolutely. Um, my first year um, teaching it, I would spend every lunch period looking at the next days because I couldn't spend too far ahead because it, it would be too overwhelming. Um, I think I joked with you that I started highlighting and then I figured out I highlighted the entire manual. So I wasn't really sure what I was highlighting anymore because all of it seems so important. Um, I think uh, we're very lucky to have Laura again. I can't say enough about her, but she gave us a lot of grace and a lot of understanding and gave us a lot of time to work as a team. And I think when you do things as a team, it makes um, your life and your frustrations much less when you take those burdens on together. I was also um, happy to have someone who had piloted it. So she had already had a year under her belt to help us through it too. But um, yeah, we took it one day at a time the first year. The kids sitting in front of me didn't have any of the kindergarten and first grade curriculum like my kids do now, which makes a, a very big difference when you go to teach it. They have a lot of background knowledge. Um, we were happy to get through what we could get through in both skills and knowledge. And then we felt like we were really picking up steam and then COVID hit and we had to make some adjustments through that. However, we were very thankful to have this curriculum through all of that virtual learning and are we in class or not in class? And now in second grade, we've had to pull back a little bit. Otherwise, we would finish at the beginning of May. So we have been able to then, after every knowledge unit, we've been able to do fun activities. We have time to build in um, activities that go with it to end our units and have fun. Those are all things that we just added last year in our fourth year. Um, so we're starting to add some bells and whistles in because we've got the foundation down and we feel comfortable teaching it. Now, when I teach it, I look at tomorrow's and go, oh, yep, I've done this five times. I've got everything I need. I know exactly how it rolls. I look at the workbook. Oh, sorry, I lost my lights. Um, and I know what my kids are doing and we're ready to roll. That's awesome. And it sounds like you're, you're able to to add in some of the bells and whistles is and it sounds like the more familiar you get the more time you have to do things like that is there yeah. are there other things that you now have more time for because you're using a curriculum that's systematic and and covering all of the the key areas of literacy yeah. um I was just telling Laura this the other day that when we meet as a team we no longer talk about what are we teaching the next day or what are we teaching in the next unit what's important what are essential learning targets we're talking data and how our kids are doing and what are we going to do for those kids who don't have it? So we can spend our time having those conversations and I don't spend all my prep time on a week trying to figure out what I'm teaching the next week and what's important and what skills do they need to have. They are all laid out in CKLA for me. I don't have to do that. Now I can spend my time on Sarah or Johnny, who's not a fluent reader. What can I do for them um, to help do that? And then I can use my teammates to help me do that as well. Um, I find, and I, I don't teach third grade, third grade I think has the most content in CKLA and the most to cover, so I can't speak for you, but in second grade it's very manageable what we're asked to cover, um, and so we, we've been able to get through it and spend our time doing things that are really important, like looking at data and making decisions for tier two interventions and tier three interventions, and those really important conversations about all right, my kids already know it. What are we going to do for them? These kids don't know it. What are we going to do for that group? We didn't have that time before to have those conversations. We were all trying to do those things in our classroom, but when we met as a team, we were talking about curriculum. The other thing I would say about this program is if you were, I have teammates who really look at themselves as a math teacher, right? Like they are great at teaching math. And if you aren't great at teaching reading, this curriculum will make you good at teaching reading. It will make you a reading teacher, even if that's not what you feel is maybe your passion. We all have our different areas. Some people like science, social studies. We have to teach it all. But this program will help you be a good reading teacher, even if that isn't your 
passion, if math is your passion or science is your passion. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And that's that's making me think of Martina, something that you were sharing about. I think you um in in your journey of kind of making the shift outside of the curriculum, it sounded like you and your teammates, your colleagues had engaged in some like um, it was like a book study over the summer. Do you mind just sharing some of the other things that you did to to work on those instructional changes? Yep. So last summer we did a really extensive professional development through the, the the entire course of the summer, and it was called Shifting the Balance. And so this was a book study that we had the book, we had the guide, and then we also had the online modules. So I would recommend for anybody who is you know feeling like they're novice in the in the science of reading conversation, um, shifting the balance is a great starting point because it is very structured. It identifies all of those misconceptions that people have about teaching reading. And it really helps you to get to that fundamental level of understanding how kids learn to read. And that's really the big thing that we wanted to look at is to understand, okay, so CKLA and Amplify really um, kind of prides themselves on following this science of reading. So what in the world is this science of reading? We wanted to understand it so that we could pick it out in our curriculum. And that's exactly what ended up happening is seeing the why behind why Amplify is structured the way that it is. Um, because you know we we understood it was really structured and it had all of these different components, but to understand why it was set up the way that it was, um, pairing this book study was really, really helpful. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really helpful to hear, um, you know, all of, there's so many different elements that go into making this shift and like really understanding the instructional practices so that, you know, a curriculum can be a guide, um, but, you know, and you get to bring in the real instruction. Um, Laura, it's making me think of, you were sharing, um, uh, kind of you had gone through a process of reevaluating the standards and figuring out like which ones are really critical for each grade level. And um, do you mind, I feel like so many people would benefit from hearing your approach to that uh, in terms of building them and working with your, with your, your team on implementing that. Do you mind speaking to that? Sure. So about the time we were looking at this shift in curriculum and part of it was like, we already talked about, you know, the time small group versus um, maybe making more time for all kids to have the um, opportunity for learning. We were also behind the scenes unpacking the standards. And so looking at, um, for instance, in first grade, there were probably 170 some standards when you when you looked at them for um, reading language arts. And as we started looking at all these standards, it's, it's like, this is overwhelming. I'm a first grade teacher. How am I going to teach all these standards? And what is the expectation of fidelity and, and success for students? And so we, um, we worked as teams and started looking at what, put the standards away for a minute and just think about it. What do you really want your first graders to be able to know and do when they leave first grade, second grade, and so on? Now, looking at the standards, where are those things in the standards and really pulling them out? And um, I know it was really hard for the staff, but I kept saying, narrow it down, narrow it down. Because there at first it was like, well, from 175, I think we can probably pull it down to like maybe 100. Nope. Let's re let's let's um, when we'll down that a little bit more. Right. So maybe 50. And, and the goal was 10 or, or less. Like, what are the big ideas? And those are the ones that we say all kids are going to have by the time they, they finish this grade level. These are what we're calling our essentials. And we had a funnel to go through for that. Um, some of the things that we asked when we were looking at them, is this, a, is this um, a skill that has endurance over time? Like this skill has, these kids need this in this grade level, like letter sounds in kindergarten, for instance, because it's gonna endure over time. Does it have leverage? Um, in other words, can this skill is going to be used in maybe other curricular areas? Um, and then um, is this something that's um, going to show up on high stakes assessments? Because let's be honest, right? We want, make, we want to make sure our students are successful in what's being asked of them even beyond our classrooms. And so um, is this a skill 
that is going to have um, is going to show up on high stakes assessments for students. And so those were kind of our big questions as we started to funnel um, and go through, weed through all the standards. And yeah, it took us some time. It also took some really um, tough conversations amongst team members, um, and as well as then vertical alignment amongst our staff. Um, I'll never forget, and Michelle can relate to this, we were sitting um, in a meeting. There were um, the, the building leadership team, so one representative from each grade level. It was the week before winter break, and we were sitting for an hour and a half um, struggling with one particular um, standard that had been turned into an essential learning outcome, that second grade. And was it was it truly building off of first grade and was it preparing for third grade? And there was a lot of conversation back and forth. And it was like five o'clock on this night, not too long before winter break. And but it was very much about building that vertical alignment and really paring down what was important. So when we came to looking at the science of reading in um, CKLA, we knew what was essential, what was really important, and, and um, Amplify has all that right there in the program for you. Like, you know exactly which assessments are, are looking at what standard, and you know exactly, like, this is a really important standard. This is one we're reporting on for our report cards because this is an essential learning outcome, and it's, it's all there. And so the two pieces we were working on at the same time, but it came together beautifully for, for us and for our students. That is really tremendous work. Michelle, you're nodding a lot. Um, is there anything you would add? Like, what I guess, what was your experience like being part of this or yeah. some the recipient of this kind of structure? Well, first, I'd like to preface that we go to a PLC convention or conference and we come home with all of these, what we should do, amazing ideas. And this was one that has, I would say, has transformed our school. I think more than anything else is choosing the essential learning target. And I, for me, three things stick out. One, it was a true lifeline through COVID because when you had to make tough decisions about what you could and couldn't do virtually and with families who weren't always diligent about being online with you, they were a lifeline. They are absolutely how we made it through regardless of what our curriculum was. Two, I now know what I have to intervene on. I can't intervene on 170 standards. I probably wouldn't be teaching anymore if that was the expectation. And it helps me focus my time on what is truly important. And um, two, it just, I just think it, it makes me, when I have to come to where maybe I can't fit everything in in a day, what is okay to skip and what is an absolutely non-negotiable that cannot be skipped. So for instance, the other day we were running long, like we had our spring pictures today, right? Cause things like that happen. And so you lose minutes. So I knew I couldn't skip the partner reading and the decoding of word sounds because those are an essential learning target. My kids have to know that to go to third grade. I didn't get to the ABC order today and they're gonna be just fine in third grade if they can't put words in ABC order. They won't be if they can't read fluently and decode words. So that's how I have to make my decisions. And the beauty part is, I know that the other three second grade teachers are going through that same thought process because those ELOs and essential learning targets are always at the top of our conversation. That's what we talk about all the time. And we're lucky enough to have a great curriculum that fits into it. But those things aren't changing regardless of what our curriculum is. And we're lucky enough to have a curriculum that I don't have to come up with new assessments to, to find out if they know my ELOs. CKLA has it all built in there for me. That's incredible and so important to have that focus, which is really hard when you're being asked to do so many different things, um, including just getting kids to, to learn how to read and actually enjoy it. So um, it's really amazing. I think that a lot of people really benefit from that. Um, I'm curious, I mean, there's even, you've done all that work, you know, as a group, but there's still, I imagine there's still kind of a, okay, now we're going to try and see if it works moment. Like, were, were, are there things that stick out to I, any of you in your journey where you like tried something new in this, in this shift? And there, I was like, okay, I see this works now. Like, was, was there like an aha moment either in a student said something, could do something different or, you know, what was that, um, Michelle? You're, you're nodding and then maybe Martine, I'll come back to you after. Is that okay? 
So I wasn't part of the pilot program. And so Mrs. Eicher and the team brought this curriculum to us and said, in kindergarten, first and second grade, you're going to have an hour of skills and you're going to have an hour of knowledge. Knowledge is not taught to mastery. It's to sort of give the kids a global view. And um, there's lots of reasons why to teach it. And in my mind, I'm thinking I'm spending an hour a day with my kids on something that's not mastery. No, that seems odd to me. So I get my curriculum materials. And my first year, I had a student in second grade who was a non-reader. He really struggled with skills. And he struggled in math. A lot of his day was a struggle. Knowledge was not. He was the most amazing oral comprehender, discussion leader, question asker, helping his friends. And he had an entire hour in the day where he excelled at something that was never there before. And about October, November, I said to Mrs. Eicher, I'm all in now, I get it. Like, but you have to get in there and you have to see it. So like when we talk to schools who are like, well, maybe we'll do skills, but not knowledge. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna want both parts because that's what really makes this curriculum special is those two parts working together. Um, and I just, I, I remember having that moment, like I remember reading with him and him and I having this conversation, I go, this is why they do it. This is why we have knowledge and um, have enjoyed teaching it ever since. That's amazing. And, and Laura, it's like you were saying before, like when you're thinking about like the students, like who we're ultimately trying to serve, like I think that's just like a great kind of connection of, of seeing the impact in, in the student that I think a lot of us are familiar with. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Martina, does anything jump out at you of like a moment where you realize like, okay, I'm trying something new and I'm, I'm seeing that it's working? I think the big thing is, especially in Wisconsin, where we have our standard or our state testing um, section all on auditory comprehension and being able to just listen. CKLA has a really large read aloud portion. So, where the shift changes for those who don't use this program or aren't familiar with it, those younger grades, like Michelle was saying, have two very distinct blocks, third and up have one giant block that kind of flows together. And one of the main components that usually shows up every single lesson is a read aloud. And I think by having something like that, that the kids are just listening to, they see pictures that go along with it, but they don't have the words in front of them. By being able to ask them to practice their comprehension skills um, through activities like that really show up you know, and, and provide them the, the practice that they need when they're going to apply it on a state test. There was a question in the chat about that, you know, how does this go along with state testing? And there's a really good example of it. It, it really models the skills that kids are going to need to master or at least have exposure to, to understand and show that, that level of understanding on, you know, on an assessment that is going to kind of grade them um, on, a, on a state level. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious, I know folks on the line are in um, kind of different places on their journey. I'd love to know from each of you, um, if someone came up to you and it sounds like they often do and said like, what is one instructional practice I could start doing tomorrow? Like, is there one that comes to mind that you would recommend? Michelle, I do you want to go? Go ahead, go ahead, Martina. Yeah, I can, um, this piggybacks off of what I just said with the read alouds. I think one thing that regardless of what you're using in your classroom, one thing that you can definitely implement is just reading to your kids. You know, find a block of time, even if it is 15 minutes. Um, March Madness is something that is, is happening right now. And for at least our district, we have a March Madness bracket of picture books and we have a March Madness bracket of chapter books. And whether or not you want to make that commitment and read 16 different books is totally up to you. But if you can find some time, even if it's during a milk break or a snack break, give those kids exposure to just listening to the story without having it right there in front of them and ask those follow-up questions, because that is really where you can start seeing, you know, kids making connections both to their own life you'll start hearing them and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I did this. And the, the character is like me because, and you can really build connections with the kids, but you can also see how much they're understanding when they can't see the words in front of them themselves. That's a really, that's a really fun idea and a really great, a great tip. Thank you. 
Um, Michelle or Laura, do either of you want to jump in? I'm sure Laura's excited to jump in, but um, I guess for me, because I'm still part of that K2 foundational and so much of it is decoding, is really putting all of those pieces together. The thing that um, I would probably continue to do, even if we didn't have CKLA, is the way that they organize um, the alphabet and the sounds and all the ways you can spell the sounds. Like on a daily basis, we're opening up our books, the, the vowel, the letter foot books that CKLA provides. And like today we looked at the schwa sound. I mean, I'm teaching, teaching schwa now in second grade. Never done that before CKLA, but that's because my kids have all of the sounds coming up. I'm not working on a ah and a uh and a, uh, you know, in second grade because they've had such a, a solid foundation coming up. So we'll look like at the long U sound and how are all the ways you can spell that? And they'll be listed out for the kids in order from most frequent to least frequent. Like um, the long I sound is spelled with the letter Y in the English language more than any other letter. And my kids are always like, why is it like that? What? Why is it so hard? Why do they do this? And like, I don't know, but we have to know how to do this. And the sound trees. Um, that piggybacks off of that, like I'll have a tree that says ah, and we'll add leaves with all sorts of words that have ah at the beginning and the middle and the end. And then we'll have a long a tree and then we'll have a shun tree and an aw tree and all the different ways these sounds are spelled because our, our language isn't easy to learn, especially if you don't know how to unpack it and you don't have the skills to do that. So those two organizational um, pieces for decoding and learning sounds has been very powerful for my kids. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Laura, anything you would add? And I would think as an administrator, right, when you have teachers who maybe are, and I think Michelle alluded to this earlier, are struggling to teach reading, especially those foundational skills, those are the tools that will help you become the best reading teacher you can be. Um, and I think, you know, when you talk about the science of reading, understanding that scope and sequence of learning um, those foundational skills is really important. And I would say from a balanced literacy perspective, I never knew if what I was teaching in balanced literacy was truly where I was at on that spectrum of teaching those skills. And so having that piece like Michelle said, whether we had the curriculum in front of us, in front of us or not, is one of those pieces that would be critical in the, in teaching the science of reading and being a being a high quality reading teacher and school. That's so helpful, and and that's making me wonder. Um, looking back on, um, you know, balanced literacy and like other other pieces that like may have been part of the puzzle but not the full like. Looking back, what do you now see as like red flags? Like, oh, I wish I had. I now I know that 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 was something I should have avoided or looked into or investigated. Is anything? I think as a as a um, as a reading. Okay, I'll let my show next. Um, um, as a principal of a school, looking back now, is there was a lit. How should I say that? I don't want to. I don't want to sound um, negative in this way, but I think we sometimes give way too much um, ownership to individual teachers and it needs to be more systematic from the very beginning all the way through because what happens and I know we're all in Wisconsin here but what we've talked a lot about is creating Swiss cheese and if you know what Swiss cheese is right it has lots of holes in it and if we're not all lockstep in in our understanding of what what is important and how we're teaching those skills and like Michelle mentioned it teaches the sounds like what are most frequent and when is it, you know, what is the least frequent? If we're not all lockstep in what that means, we're sending kids on to third grade, fourth grade as they start to learn about um, morphology, prefixes, suffixes, and on up um, that have holes. And that's not fair to kids. I can't leave kids at fifth grade looking like Swiss cheese. And so that was part of our conversation in this move to really being very intentional about what we're teaching. That's I love the metaphor. Um, it's dinner time in New York, so that's great. Um, but that that also makes me think, Michelle. Something you were saying earlier is like, there's a lot of onus on you to create to fill in the holes in the Swiss cheese. And that yeah, I, yeah. I can speak as a parent, you know. And Laura, you know, we we've all had kids go through the district. I don't want my child's reading and math ability dependent on what teacher they got that year. That, that can't be, oh, well, you know, Mrs. Martin's really good at math. My kids are going to come out good at math, but she's okay at reading. You know, 
you, ha you have to hit everything. And, and that having a universal curriculum has really um, helped us in that respect that we all have our strengths. I mean, we're all human. There's things that we all enjoy teaching or we've had background in, in training. Um, but you have to have, you have they're, teaching kids how to read is a non-negotiable. And so having something that's going to help you there. And then like Laura can support us because she knows exactly what's happening in our classroom or my interventionist can support me or my um, special ed team can write IEPs because they know exactly what's being taught in our classroom. And it's not different. My door's not closing. You're going to hear four different things in second grade. You're going to come down here and you're going to hear. I mean, even the other day I was teaching, we were doing some possession things and I said something and right across the hallway, my kids heard the exact same words come out of my teacher, my co-teacher. And my kids are like, are they doing the same thing? I'm like, yeah, they're in second grade too. Like we all do the same thing. And, and that's really, really important. Um, I don't have to go to teachers, pay teachers and pay, buy this. And I don't have to search the internet for this. I have what I need. And so I can spend my time on more, um, more important things, I think. Yeah. And some of the bells and whistles. Yeah, you get to do I some wanna... of the fun stuff. Not yeah. the first year. And that's okay. And I'm sure Martina would say the same thing. You have to give your older kids a lot of grace to the first year because they haven't had this. And it's a switch. Fourth, fifth, and third grade is very different. And they aren't going to come with the background knowledge that they are now. I'm sure you've seen a big difference over the years as kids come with having that kindergarten, first grade, and second grade background knowledge. It really changes what you can do in the curriculum and with it as well. And before we move on from, from you, Michelle, was there something else you wanted to add about kind of like looking back on some other programs you've used in the past, like things that you now see as like red flags? Um, and I'm sure Laura, and, and we're all guilty of this, but ability grouping, we thought what we were doing, we thought, oh, he's not getting the second grade curriculum. We're going to put him back with the first graders. We're going to fill those holes. And we're like, yep, we're going to do that. And then Laura's like, we start having conversations about, well, then when he goes to third grade, where does he get the second grade curriculum? And we thought at the time we were doing well. And I think now that we know better, sometimes I look back at that and it, it, it makes me cringe a little bit. But we, we were doing what we thought was right at the time. And we thought we were helping those kids. Um, and I love that all my second graders, regardless of who they are, are in my classroom. And we're all on this journey together. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's it's a lot to, to think about and reflect on. And um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to come back to small group intervention in a moment because I've, I've been seeing some questions come in the chat. But Martina, you seemed eager to to share some maybe red flags that you've now now kind of noticed from the past. Yeah, uh, one of the big red flags that came up and it kind of really came to the surface this past summer when we did all of our, our work with the science of reading was just the eagerness of us as teachers who are fluent readers to want to just kind of feed the answer to the kids, right? So you have your, uh, your, your reader out in front of you, your kids are all, you know, participating with you, whether that be small group or their whole class reading together and they get to a word that they're stuck on. And so you just want to give it to them because it's painful sometimes. Um, and you have those kids who want to read so badly in front of everybody else. And you just know that it's going to take us five minutes to get through a paragraph. But what we've really kind of come back to, and this is a practice that was around, you know, I haven't been teaching very long, but it's a practice that has been around for several years is the fact that you have to just sit there and say, sound it out. It's okay. We're going to wait. And if we have to read the sentence again, it's fine, but I want you to sound it out. And that's been really the big kind of push is before, you know, we talked about like, Ooh, spelling. Okay. You know, we're, we're going to do it if we have time, if we don't, but now we're really seeing the signs of reading is really pushing those kids to understand, especially those younger kids to understand the spelling patterns so that they can sound it out so that they can see letters and they're not scary. They can put letters together and realize they make a certain sound and work through a word without us the t as the educator giving it to them, you know, letting the ownership be back on them. That's so helpful. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a habit 
that a lot of people get into. And, and so it's, it's hard to break habits. There are books on it. I just read a great one. Um, are there other habits that were, that were hard to shake as, as any of you were making the shift or supporting your colleagues in making the shift? I don't know if this is a habit, but I think it speaks a little bit to what you were talking about um, a minute ago, Laura, about small group instruction. I think that's one thing that, especially at elementary school, teachers feel like if they're not doing working with a small group that has a specific need, they're like really not meeting that need. Like whole group universal instruction seems scary. Um, like really, am I am I going to be actually addressing the needs of individual kids in a whole group for sixty minutes? Yes. Um, but I also think it takes some time to understand how to make that shift from large or from small group individualized small group instruction to a large group instruction. Um, and it takes some finesse, right? So you, as you're teaching a whole group, understanding, oh, I've got a couple kiddos over here that I already know struggle with this. So I'm going to make sure I do a special sweep by and, and sit by them and listen to them as we're in this whole group instruction or doing a little bit back and forth of, now it's it's partner reading time. I'm gonna let the partner readers go off, but I know I have a certain partner that I'm gonna be partnering with because they need extra practice, right? So it's really knowing your students, not pigeonholing them into groups because they have a certain level on a running record or they're on a certain level in a in a reader, but because they have a specific skill. And um, so I, I feel like after the amount of time we've been doing this, teachers have a re have found a really fine have fine tuned um, found a finesse. In, in making sure they're meeting with small groups. And it's not super structured like maybe it was in balanced reading, but it has a much more ebb and flow to it. It's that intervention is good prevention or prevention is good intervention, right? You're preventing it on the front end. Um, we also, I will say it's, it's been important in our schedule to make time for tier two, tier three for a little more structured um, interventions. But yes, small group instruction is a little bit scary um, going from that to like this whole group in front of me, I've got, you know, 23 or whatever it is, first graders, and they have very different needs. How am I going to do this? Trust the plan, trust the system. It works. That's super insightful. Thank you so much, Michelle. I know you, you kind of opened with, you were work, you were working in small groups for an hour and a half. So do you mind adding any, like, what was it like for you switching to whole class to more whole class instruction? Um, I guess for me, I was excited to go to whole group because I was spending so much of my prep time. What are my other kids going to do while I'm teaching reading? And that consumed a lot of our time because I had first graders and second graders who had to be able to do it independently because I couldn't stop my reading group or I didn't really want to stop my reading group to go and put out little fires because they didn't know what they were doing at their desk. And trying to keep them quiet and engaged for an hour while I'm trying to keep my reading group engaged wasn't an easy task. And so um, going back to something like this that absolutely has opportunities for small group in it, um, I was excited for it. It was a switch, I think, for some of our my colleagues. They liked that small group, five or six kids in front of them working on the same thing. Um, but you have to be really knowledgeable if you're going to do something like that about what skill are we working on? What's the next one? Um, and if you don't have a universal curriculum, how do you move through that throughout a year if you don't have someone telling you these are the skills they need and that I'm working on them or my co-teachers working on the same? What's first grade doing? What does third grade need from me? Um, and so we all have to kind of have each other's back because I know first grade is teaching those things. So I know when they get to me that they've had that and um, I'm reaping the benefits and I'm hoping my, my third grade teachers are reaping the benefits too. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest things in CKLA is and we were doing spelling before and um, I've never loved the idea of just memorizing words, taking a test and moving on. So what I tell people about CKLA is they teach kids how words work. My kids know how words work and they can apply it to different words throughout reading and writing. They don't have to just memorize a list. They know how these letters and sounds work together. They know that if they hear the yuh sound, it's always at the beginning of a word because that's where it always is if there's a Y at the beginning of the word. So they're learning how words work and it's amazing to watch them on their journey of figuring that out. That's incredible. And, you know, I imagine, you know, we all crave structure. It's comforting and helpful. And especially in the English language, like 
it's hard to find like what the actual patterns and structure is. Like, I'm curious, kind of going back to where we started, like what, um, how has, has really implementing a system with knowledge, phonics, vocabulary, like, can you speak to the impact on the student and like what, um, what it's like for your kids? Martina, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I think the, the big thing is the fact that we are building very well-rounded readers because we have all of these components that are coming together to make you know, this, this whole reading um, subject. It's not just they're learning to read, but they're also learning how spelling patterns work and how to you know, put prefixes or where to put these prefixes. So they're learning all of the components that they're going to need to become really strong readers and not just fluent readers, but also readers that can apply those skills in their own writing if they wanted to, to do that. So that's, that's something that I see is really important is the fact that because there are so many different components that come together to make this program, they allow kids plenty of opportunities to practice all of the skills that make up the subject of reading. Thank you. That's awesome to hear. Um, is there anything else, Laura, Michelle, that you would add? I was just going to add, I think actually it has um, liberated our teachers and our kids. Um, one of the things that we have done is we have um, no, we no longer have a standalone science or social studies curriculum uh, because um, what we are doing um, is so embedded. They're, they're learning their reading skills in the context of real information. And so it's allowed kids to really be um, focused on what they're learning, right? Isn't that the point of uh, learning to read is reading to learn. And so I feel like that has really um, freed up our teachers and our kids and our kids probably don't realize it because they're little, right? But their day is less fragmented. It's really embedded in what they're learning. And so that that science of reading is just a part of their information they're also learning. Um, so I feel like it's just been a really like, ha, ah, we've got this you're learning and you're learning to read at the same time. Thank you, that is so wonderful to hear. Um, I, we've had a lot of questions about CKLA specifically. So you all are referencing the, the Amplify curriculum. Um, so I thought maybe Laura, we could, if you wanted to ask some to the group before you do though, is there, before we move on to that section, is there anything else that, that any of you wanna share um, kind of outside of the product? Uh, that you think the audience, that you really want to share with the audience. All right, then Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you so much. This has been an incredible discussion. And as my, my other friend Laura said, we do have a lot of, a lot of great questions. Um, so let me start with, someone asked, can you speak about the books that student read, the students read? So ladies, if you could talk about the decodables, your experience with them. We, we did a recent update. They're really gorgeous. I got to see some in person last week. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experiences with them. I can go. I've only um, I've only had my experience of teaching the second grade books, but my kids are absolutely loving every single reader that we do. Um, this is one thing we were talking about the other day. Since doing CKLA, I don't get any more like my kids reading at fourth grade level. How are you going to challenge them? My kids reading at third grade level. How are you going to challenge them? What are you going to do different? Because my kids, regardless of their reading level, are super engaged in the readers. They are excited when we get a new one. And I I probably sound a little strange, but I'm always excited when I'm like, oh, I finally get to give them Sir Gus. We get to read Sir Gus today. I get to give them the cat bandit. I can't wait to share this with them. So after five years of um, teaching this, I'm still excited to hand out the readers um, to them. And whether you're a strong reader or you're a struggling reader, all of my kids are engaged in the characters and what's happening. And they have absolutely, they still ask if we can pull out the Cat Bandit from September just to read for fun. Um, it's probably one of our favorite, favorite books. So we're in Sir Gus right now, which is one of my favorite books, but they're, they're books that the kids can read and yet they are real stories. I would say part of our old curriculum, some of the stories were a little odd because they were trying to teach this sound or this 
skill. And, and so they were trying to piece it together and make a story where these are actual stories. And my kids are learning about things, um, obviously, in small town Wisconsin, they don't know much about New York City. So we get to read about that and have conversations about that. And um, my kids absolutely adore the readers. And they've held up after five years. They're still good. So yeah, I would agree with Michelle with what you're saying with the readers. I, I hesitate to use the word decodable texts or decodable books because they really don't fit that structure. You know, they don't fit, fit uh, from thir in third grade. They don't fit a phonics skill that they're trying to hit. It, it, it really is almost like a chapter book that the kids are reading through um, that goes along with what we're, we're working on. The the awesome thing about Amplify and especially the readers is the fact that if you have kids who are really strong readers, you know, those books are great for them. If you have kids who are not so stellar readers or you have students who are ESL um, students, there are options for them to be able to listen to the story and have the digital component right in front of them. We have a lot of um, materials that can be translated into Spanish. So there are options for kids, but the stories are not cut and dry. You know, it's not a, a pattern of words that they're reading, but it's really stories that they want to explore um, versus just being told like today we're going to work, work on a certain phonics skill and this is all we're reading about. And in second grade, CKLA has done a really nice job. Whatever sounds we've worked on in that unit, they're starting to add words and as we go through chapters, for them to use those sounds like the schwa plus L. So now we're doing words that have that in there. Those words aren't in the cat bandit. They're not in kids that fell. You know, those, those tough words that we're now doing because they're ready for it in March aren't there in September and October. And they don't expect them to read words that they haven't been taught those sounds. And yet they are still very engaging stories. The kids have no idea that today we're going to read about Dwight's lights because we just learned IGH and that makes the I sound my kids don't know they're just they just think he's hilarious and they love the story so they they don't know that that's why that story falls where it falls that is so incredible we love to hear that I have some some friends at work who are just gonna be so excited to hear that thank you for sharing those stories I think we can sneak in one last question um for those of us who are instructional leaders can you give some guidance about how to address teachers concerns about the small group instructions we talked laura you talked a little bit laura eicher i should say you talked a little bit about changing to to the lesser amounts of small group instruction or fewer opportunities for it can you talk about how you got everyone on board with that i'm sure that was was not necessarily easy no it wasn't and i think the first thing was is like we're just going to try this right let's try this let's get started and then uh, when you are feeling a struggle somewhere let's talk about how to accommodate maybe a smaller group of kids um, we also built time and i know it's not available in everybody's schedule but we did carve out maybe it was only 20 minutes sometimes we did carve out times where we had small it was called tier two um what is intended to be just a small group and we'll start there, right? And, and I think as teachers have become really more familiar with the curriculum, they know, they know how to do the dance, less need is placed on an have to have a small group because I know very well who my kids are that are struggling and what they're struggling with. And I can intervene on the fly as I'm going through the lesson. Now I know the curriculum really well. I know what my 60 minutes of skills looks like for today. I also know that what I'm teaching today, um, Susie over here is going to struggle and, you know, Susie over here, or Johnny over here is going to have a different, and I can um, make sure that I am where I need to be for those kids when I need to be there. Um, but it was for me as an, as a principal walking and saying, you know, like, let's just try it, give it a go. And then let's talk about what, what it was that needs to be maybe tweaked or, or, and now five years in, they're telling me <laughs> how they're making that all work. And it's, and it's beautiful. Yesterday we had a, a school visiting and they're sharing their stories about how to make that work. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know that beautiful. That's so great. Michelle, Martina, I want to give you a second to, to add on there if there's anything, any anything that worked for you that made it a little bit less, you know, scary, bothersome, anything along those lines. I think if you just trust the process, that first few years, you're going to feel like you need all these small groups because the kids don't have the background knowledge when they come to your room. Now, I think 
my stars that I have my amazing kindergarten and first grade teachers that I do and are teaching the curriculum and the fidelity, my need for small groups isn't as what it used to be because the kids are excelling in the universal curriculum. So when I talk to Mrs. Iker about my tier two kids, I'm talking about two or three. My coworkers are only talking about two or three. We're not remediating an entire classroom like we used to because the entire classrooms don't need it. And I'm finding less and less need for small groups because the need just isn't there. My kids are getting the skills that they need um, and are applying them for what we need them to do in second grade. And so it just isn't that huge need. It's not a daily basis unless I'm talking about my tier two intervention time, but that's that's why that's there because you're never going to have a curriculum that catches every kid on the first go around. There's always going to be kids that need extra time to step in and um, we have that built into our schedule to do that, but I don't need it within the curriculum on a daily basis. All my kids just don't need it. That's great. All right, I think we're just over time and I know it's late for some of you. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Special thanks to our two Laura's, Martina and Michelle. We really appreciate your time and, and walking us through your stories today. I just wanna remind all of you in attendance with us today that you're gonna get a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's conversation. You'll get another email with a link to your certificate of attendance. And we have so much more to share with you. So be sure to check out amplify.com slash literacy dash is dash opportunity series. I'm gonna throw the, the slide up again so you can see a little bit more. Uh, we've got a lot going on, particularly in March, April, and May. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody, and take care. Thank you.